visual effects look so much more real when you are able to combine it with, with real life elements, you know? Like yeah. being able to do a real explosion and then comp in fake explosions around it, they suddenly look way more real because the real explosion is carrying so much weight. If you spend any amount of time online, then you more than likely have already seen a video by Corridor Digital because their videos tend to get shared like crazy on social media. Uh, but basically they're a YouTube channel uh, that creates short films with a surprisingly high production value. Um, so they're typically related to like video games. So they'll do like a short film called GTA, but in real life. Um, and basically their films are always different. They're always unique. And there's always a lot of challenges related to the visual effects. So I'm always interested in like how they're able to like produce, like rapidly produce these high budget, you know, short films. Um, so the guy behind most of these visual effects is this guy called Ren, that's his name, called Ren, um, who basically, he, he started making visual effects, like tests and experiments in his bedroom, um, but by learning from a whole bunch of tutorials, he was able to eventually get a job at Corridor Digital, and for the last several years, has been making all of their visual effects in their short films. Um, and he's now basically like a professional problem solver, like how to, how to achieve a specific effect on like a shoestring budget on a tight deadline, um, which is really, it's, he knows a lot about visual effects. So uh, so I sat down with him for an hour and we talked about like how he got started in visual effects, um, his advice for those that are looking to get into it today, like where should they start? How should they learn? Um, as well as tips on like how to make a low budget short film look high budget. So his tips on that. Um, and as well as that, he gave me a tour of his office of Corridor Digital in, uh, in Los Angeles, which is very cool. But before we get to that, a quick message from our sister company and sponsor of this video, Polygon whom Corridor Digital actually used in their latest video. Uh, they did a self-driving cars video and they used our road textures, which turned out very nicely. Um, so Polygon offers a library of high quality textures and materials. Um, so things like photo scan grounds, uh, wood, marble, tiles, thousands and thousands, right? Um, and they're all expertly crafted uh, with 3D artists in mind. Um, and with the new Blender add-on that we've just released, um, you basically can get a complete material in Blender in just a couple of quick clicks, which is very cool. So discover the difference that a high quality texture can make to your next render by signing up for a free account at Polygon and downloading some of our free textures there. And now on to the studio tour. All right, this is our Corridor Digital Studio. Check it out, we got a carbon fiber logo. Who has that? <laughs> we do. Nice, wow. Yeah, so this is where we all work. We try to work at least most of the time. Sometimes it's a little distracting to have people throwing cards or shooting arrows. This is a video game that has never worked. Nico apparently bought this for like 200 bucks. He's like, oh yeah, it totally works. I've never once seen it work in five years, so. Nice. We recently had a card throwing expert come by and teach us how to throw cards and he left us with these foam boards to continue practicing but this one we're just keeping as a trophy because all of these that he did he was throwing them from up there on the banister across the room to the wall right here just like no whoosh, whoosh. we have a vlog channel we put out a new video every other day on the sam and nico channel and the guys who work on that work right here so they do all the shooting and all the editing while everyone else kind of just you know, is on camera, whether we're doing something with work related to the Corridor channel or, you know, just antics, like throwing cards at a wall. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so they'll shoot it all, they'll edit it all, they, they like to um, have their corner here. Right. <laughs> and of course there's uh, Nerf guns for any time someone comes by wanting to battle, you gotta be prepared. This is Nico's desk. He doesn't really use it that much. He kind of mostly works in the back room on a, a laptop. Mm -hmm. This is my workstation. Uh -huh. So this is where I do all like the rendering and stuff. I've got a computer here with four GTX 1080 cards in it. What? Because I use, I use Octane Render. I, I'm sorry, I do, I do not use Blender. <laughs> uh, 
Is there many late nights spent at these desks? Sometimes, not as much anymore. We've gotten a lot better at being able to manage our, our time effectively. So yeah. we're not having to do all nighters. Wow. One time, so I was doing a video called Mario Skate mm -hmm. and we we're leading up to the release of it and I was gonna be gone for an entire week. So I had to get this thing done before I left. And so I finished that video with four all nighters in a row. I think I got maybe about five or six hours of sleep over the course of five days. Whoa. It was brutal. I pretty much spent the entire next week sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can't continue that much longer. Yeah, that was, that was a hard video. So yeah, this is the back room. We do all of our meetings and stuff in here. It's kind of just a quiet getaway. So Sam and Nico like to lock themselves in here sometimes when, you know, it's all crazy out there, uh -huh. uh, especially with it being such an open space. They, they like to come back here to to either just focus or, or have a meeting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if we go this way, we got mm -hmm. our Minecraft room. Ooh. So we actually painted these walls for a video we did uh, about four years ago called Superheroes vs. Gaming Heroes. Mm -hmm. And it opens with this Minecraft character, like mm -hmm. literally just toiling away at a, at a wall. So we painted this for it. We wanted to do it practically and we've left it there ever since. So now we just have this generic Minecraft wall. We should talk about the guns. Yes, so here in America, we like our guns. All of these guns are completely fake. We've used them in a video at some point or another. Uh, it's, it's so we've just kind of accumulated them over the years. So we did a, a thing with EA called The Division. It was a big video game that was released and we did like a full on 40 minute film for it. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to get a whole bunch of guns for that film. And so we've just kind of had them laying around ever since then. And some of our largest videos have been, you know, gun battle based, you know, stuff like uh, Battlefield. Yeah, mm -hmm. battle, the Battlefield franchise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're all airsoft guns, meaning that they fire uh, like fake BBs, essentially. So oh, none of sweet. them are real. Right. Uh, and most of them actually don't even work anymore. They're all broken. Uh, Holy crap. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they have heft to them. They're actually, you know, most of them are made out of metal. They feel heavy. They feel like real guns. So what's great for using uh, BB guns like this is that you can fill them with the gas that fires the BB. <laughs> but yeah, so like the magazine here, you could fill it with this gas, which will fire the BBs, but it'll also make this chamber here like blow back like this, oh, which is right. great when you're doing a short film using fake guns because you're going to put a fake muzzle flash over it anyway. So having this like fly back like this helps add to the realism of like that's an actual real gun being fired. Back here we got props, any sort of props you might want. We got, we got Nerf guns, we got dead bodies, we got remote controlled cars, we got helmets of every variety, we got armor, we got all kinds of glasses, wigs, uh, fake blood. And that's pretty much our studio. We don't really spend too much time back here unless we're starting to you know, work on a new project. The workshop is right in there. I like spending time in there anytime we need to build new props or anything that you know, we'd rather just not buy or we can perhaps repurpose. Mm -hmm. We're going there, we gotta, you know, classic workshop tools. Which we wanna check out, because it's too dark. <laughs> so we've been in this specific studio, Studio 4, for about four and a half years now, coming up on five. Right. Yeah, so we've been in here since 2013. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, Corridor has been around since 2010. Yeah. So. Wow. Where yeah. were you before that? What was the offices before that? The offices before this were actually in Sam and Nico's apartment. Really? Which was like literally on the other side of this wall right here. <laughs> what? Yeah, so they were working out of their apartment. I worked out of their apartment for a year and a half or so. And mm -hmm. then this place opened up and it's like, well, let's just get it. They don't still live here. So yeah, so else? Sam recently moved out, but Nico still lives there. Really? Yeah, so okay. he's the last one, him and his wife, Ivy. Wow. Yeah. No way. And over here, over here we have our fan art wall, basically our address is publicly available. You can find it online. Mm. And people have been sending us artwork uh, of us, of random things, letters and whatnot. And so every time we get a new piece of art, we just kind of throw it up on the wall. Like this one's particularly cool. It's us oh, nice. etched in like laser engraved into wood. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah. Is it like, would that be done with a, like a printer? Yeah, like a CNC laser right. sort of printer. Wow, that's really cool. Ren. Hi. Uh, when you go to a party, someone asks you, what do you do? What do you normally tell them? It depends what kind of party. Uh, usually I say YouTuber, because you know, I make videos for YouTube, and that's the easiest way 
to say it, I guess. And it usually is enough to spark conversation like, oh, really? You make videos on YouTube? How do you make money? It's like, oh, yeah, this, this line of reasoning again. Uh, <laughs> people still don't realize you can make money on YouTube. It's weird. Hmm. But yeah, uh, and beyond that, I just say I'm a visual effects artist. Right. Yeah. At Corridor Digital. At yeah. Corridor, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So explain, um, well, first of all, your backstory. What were you always interested in effects or creative arts? I always had a flair for the creative, but like very technical creative stuff, as visual effects is. And I never, I never realized that VFX was the way I wanted to go until I started dabbling in it and, and actually starting to make my own little experiments using visual effects and After Effects and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That was when I, I realized, oh yeah, this is what I want to do. But before that, I had already been doing it. I just didn't realize that's what I was doing. I was just using like a, a you know off the shelf video editor, using a, a camera that my dad had, and just doing things like lay, layering different layers of video tracks and cropping it in a certain way so you can like do the cloning effect. All right, have yeah. Multiple people on screen at the same time. Yeah. Uh, that was in. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't one when growing up, like watching films, like one day I'm going to be a filmmaker. Right. I want to learn how to do that. It's like, that was never really my thing. I enjoyed movies, who didn't? Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. Huh. Is, yeah. Do you remember what your first, uh, first short was about? That cloning effect or? Yeah, this, oh, it's so bad. I don't even like want to look at it ever again. It's funny, uh, basically I just put a, a, a the camera on my desk and I just, I, I was in my bedroom and I just filmed me standing there and then I filmed me standing behind me and going boo and scaring me and then I went running off. I was so proud of that, not gonna lie, I was, I was so proud of that video. Yeah. Because I thought this was like, this is changing the world and yeah. it's like this is the most basic of basic <laughs> video edits. And how old were you then? I was 18. Okay, yeah. right. And you, so what did you do straight after school? After high school, so I, after high school I went to college, I was getting a degree in mechanical engineering and I finished it, I got the degree, I went through all of college, uh, through all the heartache of studying and taking math classes and all that stuff to pretty much two months before graduating, realized I don't want to be an engineer, I want to make videos for YouTube. Uh, so at that point I might as well have just finished the, the degree, so I did, but I immediately right after graduating started focusing on trying to make you know, short films put them on YouTube, hopefully they get views, and slowly but surely I started gaining enough of a following that Sam and Nico here at Corridor took notice of me and we eventually ended up meeting up and have been working together ever since. No way, so you had your own channel at the start? Yeah, Okay. Yeah, in fact my own channel has like 180,000 subscribers. <laughs> That's decent. It's pretty good, I'm, yeah. I'm really proud of that. I mean, I haven't uploaded pretty much anything to it in years. Uh, I wow. upload like maybe one or two videos a year to that channel, Yeah. Uh, so, but it's still mine, you know, it's still like, I'm, it's still the, the YouTube channel that belongs to me. I can upload anything I want to it. Yeah. I just don't because it's, it's better for me to upload stuff to the Corridor and San Manico channels. So. Do you remember which video it was that got their attention and you got in contact with them? Yeah, it was a, it was a Skyrim time-lapse video. Okay. Like Skyrim had just come out and I, I spent probably, I think about 95 hours in a single week playing this game. What? And by the end of that week, I was like, what am I doing with my life? Oh God, I need to do something. And I remember uh, this is, mods for the game were just starting to come out, so I was able to install like beauty mods and I, using command co uh, controls, like the console commands, mm -hmm. I was able to uh, slow down time or slow down the movement of uh, the camera and stuff like that. And I just, I started doing like weird camera moves and assembled this huge time-lapse video. And that was like one of the first videos of mine that like really like, just got a lot of views in a short amount of time. Yeah. And Nico from Corridor saw it and he was like, wow, that was really cool. And yeah. And, and, what, and what, what happened? He, uh, he emailed you and... Well, I, mean, I emailed them. Like I was the one trying to get in contact with them because uh, they were the hot shots at the time. So yeah, I, just, I eventually ended up moving here to Los Angeles and I was just trying to do freelance and work on my Where channel. were you before? I was in Portland, Oregon. Ah. Yeah, so north of here, yeah, yeah. about a thousand miles or so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's where I went to school. Uh, that's where I, where I consider myself to be from. And, but now I live here in LA. Yeah. So yeah, so I pretty much just packed up everything I had into my car, drove down to LA, realized once I got here, I didn't have any plan. I was like, oh God, what do I do? I slept in the, the Whole Foods parking lot the first night I got here before getting no to the No way, hotel. Yeah. really? And this wow. is, I was, so I'm actually partnered with Fullscreen, uh, you know, the MCN company that partners YouTube channels and whatnot. Oh, yeah. So I was partnered with them and at the time they only had like 10 employees. So they let me just crash on their couch until I found an apartment. Really? Yeah, it was really great. Nice. 
That's cool. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I pretty much just worked on my own doing freelance stuff for a few months before uh, finally working with Sam and Nico. They, yeah, Nico asked me, he's like, hey, do you want to shoot behind the scenes content for us? And I was like, yes, when do I start? And he's like, great. <laughs> um, in a couple weeks, would that be fine? I was like, sure, I'll be there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, no hesitation. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I would like to do. Do you think there's an opportunity for visual effects artists out there that are capable to start their own successful channel? Five years ago, I would say yes. Uh, Today, I, you know, it hurts me to say this, but no. Because I, I don't want, I don't want to like, I don't want to put a damper on someone's enthusiasm. If you want to do it, absolutely go for it. Yeah. But it's, it's really hard to kind of break through the noise in today's age of like YouTube. Hmm. Um, you know, trying to make a name for yourself uh, when you have none. It's, it's not that it can't be done, it's just harder to do than it was five years ago. Yeah. And especially for making short form content, you know, one to two minutes long because, you know, you spent a whole month working on it because as a VFX artist, you, you go by frames. You don't go by seconds or minutes, you go by the number of frames in a shot. And so if you spend, you know, a day working on 73 frames in a shot and the next day working on 100 frames for a shot, a month can easily go by before it totals up to like a couple minutes worth of content. And, and with YouTube prioritizing content that is longer form, uh, more frequent uploads, yeah. that sort of content kind of goes away. And that's kind of why you're actually starting to see a lot of VFX channels or channels that have a lot of VFX in them are starting to not really upload as much anymore because there's not as much monetary incentive, hmm. which is really, really unfortunate. That's my favorite kind of content is like a right. good solid one to two minute short film on YouTube. Right. It's digestible. You're like, okay, that was fun to watch and you move on with your life. Yeah. Maybe share it with your friends. But people don't really do it anymore because, you know, there's only so far you can do something without any return before you're just like, I'm, I'm done wasting thousands of dollars. Yeah, right, right. Hmm. So back in the day, it was easier to make money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. YouTube changed their whole algorithm on how they, how they divvy out ad revenue. And it's, it's harder these days to do it. It's yeah. still possible. We certainly still do it. But yeah. we're one of, you know, just a small handful of channels that still do it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess a lot of people want to know what the relationship between Coral Digital and Freddie is. Um, oh, yeah. Because okay. Freddie's the one that's... So, yeah, Freddie Freddy and Brandon were the, the guys to start it all, really. They, they weren't the ones to start YouTube channels doing weekly content and stuff like that, but they were the first ones to make serialized short films mm -hmm. with high production value. You know, they, they got a reputation for being the VFX guys mm -hmm. or the gun guys, for instance. But really, they focused on more than just putting visual effects in. They had good cinematography. They had good choreography. They had good editing. They had good sound design. They had all of the whole package that you would normally see in, in more professional situations like TV shows or movies. Yeah. But they did it on, like, you know, a fraction of a fraction of the same budget. Yeah, right. They were able to do it for pretty much for free other than their time and cost of the equipment that they owned. Yeah. And... What was the question? Oh, what, what's its relationship to Kyle? Right. Yeah. So yeah, so they, they started it all. You know, they were a huge inspiration for me when I started. Uh, and then same thing for Sam and Nico. They all lived together. They worked in the same studio. And so they, Freddie and Brandon started making videos. And Sam and Nico were like, hey, actually, you know what? You guys are onto something. We're going to try that too. Yeah. And so they started putting out their own YouTube videos. And they, yeah, so back in the day, they were the only two YouTube channels who were able to put out quality content. Uh, visual quality content. You know, every, meanwhile, everyone else was just, you know, recording with a handy cam of themselves or, you know, random sketches with their friends where, you know, the, the writing might be really good, but the camera angles might not be solid. The editing might be kind of wonky. Yeah. Visual quality of the image itself might be lackluster. Right. Um, so they worked together. Eventually, Freddie and Brandon ended up splitting. There, there isn't any bad blood between them or anything like that. Brandon actually works next door. We're pretty good friends with him. And yeah, Freddie wanted to do more long form content. Brandon wanted to make games. So they're like, all right, this is a, this is a time to kind of go our separate ways. Yeah. So Freddie has the Rocket Jump channel and they still put out videos. They still work on uh, long form shows like on Hulu. They had a Hulu show. Uh, they just came out with Dimension 404, another Hulu show. Of course, they had Video Game High School for several years, whereas Corridor, we, we stayed focused on making Corridor videos, you know, right, yeah. um, you know the short films. And yeah, so, I mean, we're all still friends. Anytime we see each other, we hang out and have fun. Yeah. Uh, but 
Yeah, I mean, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. It's I, like, yeah, yeah we're, I mean, we're friends. We, we don't really work together anymore. Uh, yeah. I mean, Brandon and Sam and Nico work together still because they have their gaming channel that they work on. But. Right. Yeah. yeah, the Node? Yeah, Node. Right. Yeah, exactly. And what do they do? They just record videos <clears throat> playing games? Yeah, you know, the, yeah. the pride and joy of YouTube these days is, is <laughs> video game videos, you know, just watching yeah. us play a, play a video game. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's fun. It's not really my cup of tea watching that sort of content, but... I, I, I understand it, you know, like I get why people like it because they're, they're able to hang out. It's not about the game, it's about the people playing the game. Right. And so it's, it's more for like the viewers to be able to hang out with those people while like, like sitting on a couch with your friends playing a game. Yeah, that's right. While it's their turn to play. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so. It's interesting that that, uh, that whole, I don't know what you call it, like a content strategy, uh, it, it's hard to know whether or not you can be a success in that because it's largely based on your personality. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you see, I mean, everybody wants to be the next gaming YouTuber um, yeah. and very few will, you know. I mean, very say. few will actually be the thing that they want to be. You got to have the right gumption, the right motivation. Right. right. That, that, was, that was a depressing thing to say. Uh, no, no, I mean, anyone can, can do it, but it's, it's way harder to actually do it than just as evident by the number of people actually doing it versus the people who want to do it. Right, yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't do it. I don't think I have the right personality to be an on-screen, or sorry, I don't, I don't think I have the right sort of personality to do gaming videos and have people watch that. Mm, I, don't know. Right. I'm a, I think I'm a little too nerdy for that sort of thing. Not that nerdy is a bad thing, but like I, I, I would probably get too obsessed with like random details that no one cares about. Right. Uh, <laughs> except for me, I'm like, dude, did you see the battery in this video game? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know. Huh. Where do you think that that, um, that comes from, the, the motivation to... Because you taught yourself um, um, After Effects. And yeah. What other programs do you use? Uh, 3ds Max and, of course, tons of plugins for both. So, like, for compositing, I use After Effects. For editing, Premiere Pro. And for 3D sort of generated stuff, that's all 3ds Max for me. Right, yeah. 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 <coughs> <laughs> yes, mean, posting uh, this Blender, on a Blender, I mean. heavily blended channel. I looked into using Blender way back in the day, but the, the user interface just confused me way too much. And so I was like, honestly, the main reason why I ended up choosing 3ds Max is because that was exactly the program that Sam and Nico were using. Right. And so when I ended up working with them, uh, I was able to get help from them. Like anytime I had a problem, it's like, I don't know how to get past this before I would spend hours scouring the internet, you know, making forum posts, asking for help, all that sort of thing. But yeah. when you have an expert sitting behind you who can answer your question in less than 20 seconds, it's yeah. really helpful. So yeah. I ended up kind of getting more and more entrenched in using 3ds Max. Hmm. And within that, I use plugins like uh, FumeFX, uh, Rayfire. Hmm. Um, in the last couple of years, I've been using a rendering program called Octane, mm -hmm. which I'm in love with. I right. think it's great. Yeah. Have you tried any others? No, not really. <laughs> Honestly, I kind of—I didn't really know how to do 3D rendering before even using Octane. Hmm. Uh, I so that was your first sort of. It was. It was kind of like my second. My first introduction was using a plugin called Element 3D oh, right. by Video Copilot, which yeah. is just a plugin inside of After Effects. And I mean, it doesn't do nearly as much as what a dedicated 3D program can do, but you can import 3D models and set up lighting, track it into a shot. It was enough for me to kind of like dip my toes in what it's like doing 3D rendering and, and kind of just understanding the entire theory behind like rendered images and especially like passes, you know, your diffuse pass, specular pass, all that sort of stuff, what different types of maps are. It kind of taught me the foundation of that just by using it in Element 3D, so. Right, yeah. Eventually, I got to the point where I was like, okay, I want to be able to render this stuff on my own, and I started trying to use Mental Ray. I tried using V-Ray, and I just, I didn't, I didn't get it at all. Like, yeah. the whole, like, texture thing in, in 3ds Max was confusing. But recently, in the last few years, they went to a, a node-based texture. Um, the map editor, the texture, the, yeah, the map editor. Sure. Yeah, yeah and it, so it's all node-based, and that makes so much more sense to me that suddenly things started clicking, I started getting a lot better at being able to render stuff. Right. I feel like I'm still learning. Yeah. I don't consider myself an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but yeah, it's slowly but surely I'm getting there. Yeah, how did you, um, yeah, how did you learn? Was it tutorials? Was tutorials, it? man. Dude, yeah. Just, I, I, I'm a firm believer that you could learn anything online. Yeah. Like, if there's something you want to learn more about, there's probably a whole YouTube series on how to learn <laughs> that one thing. Yeah. And if not beyond that, there's, you know, articles, written articles of how to do this stuff. 
Um, I'm, I'm a believer that you can learn anything online, but there's, there's like two different categories of things that you can learn, right? There's the theory, and then there's the technical side of things. Um, I'm a, I firmly believe that technical stuff you have to teach yourself, you know, using how to use a program, uh, fumbling your way through all the user interface and all that stuff. You gotta learn that through experience. You can't be taught that. Mm -hmm. You can have someone walk through it, you can have someone uh, answer questions for you when you get stuck, but the only way you learn is by doing it yourself and, and making mistakes yourself, struggling through it and then persevering and then finally succeeding with the effect you're trying to make. Yeah. That's how you learn. Mm -hmm. But the, the theory side of things, that's something that needs to be taught. Right. You can learn so much, but you can learn bad habits without realizing it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, this is how it works for me, so that's just how I've always done it. But then you have a professional comes in and is like, uh, maybe gives a lecture on like, you know, film theory of like how, how colors work and all that stuff. That's the sort of thing that you actually need help being taught and learn uh, by reading and absorbing rather than teaching yourself because you could easily teach yourself the wrong thing. Right, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you, there's a, there's some artists, like, I don't know, it's almost like some people are against tutorials and then others like only use tutorials. But they're like, oh, I, I never use a tutorial. And I think, well, you're missing out it's, on a lot. I mean, I, I can kind of understand that reasoning because a tutorial can sometimes lead to you just making carbon copies of what the tutorial yeah. is. And that's, that's, I used to get people sending me their demo reels, and I, when I can recognize a tutorial in your demo reel, I'm automatically clicking out. I'm like, nope, yeah. don't. Like, copying a tutorial and doing it is great. Yeah. I highly recommend doing it, but it's not something to share. You know, I mean, you can share it to a little. In your Facebook or something. Yeah, on, like, you can share it with your video. friends, and if you're proud of it, sure, go ahead and share it. It's not that big of a deal, but when you get to a point where you're actually like, looking for work and you want to have respect, if they recognize a tutorial in that demo reel, they're going to be like, all that your demo reel has showed me is that you know how to uh, follow the steps and instructions of someone else. You haven't shown me that you know how to figure out something from scratch on your own. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, but the other side of the problem is that if you only just know how to do stuff that you've taught yourself just through experience, then you may be missing out on certain features of, of the program. You might be missing out on certain tips and tricks because professionals of all kinds, they, they come up with their own tips and tricks for how to do certain things. Yeah. And when they share that, that is valuable information that you should, you should definitely take any chance you get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it could speed up your workflow. And I, I think overall, people accept that. They're, they're willing to accept help. They're willing to watch a tutorial here and there. I don't really watch tutorials that much anymore mm. uh, because the programs I use, I have a good enough grasp on them that I can probably figure out what I need to do without using a tutorial. Mm. But anytime I'm, I'm booting up a new program I've never touched before, the first thing I do is I watch a few tutorials. Mm. I just spend half an hour, I just watch a few videos just to kind of get like, okay, what do these buttons do? Now I know what those buttons do. What do what these options and, and settings do? And you kind of get a good grip on where to start your experimenting. Mm -hmm. I don't expect that to take me from beginning to end on, right, on yeah. using something. Yeah. But it's enough that I always use tutorials on starting, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. or, okay. if, or if someone has a, a tutorial on how to do something cool and new, on a, like a new effect or something I didn't know how to do before, I'm like, oh yeah, how'd you do that? I'll just kind of watch the tutorial. Okay, I think I know how to do it now. Yeah. Uh, I don't really follow it hand in hand like I used to back in the day. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's important to have that balance of, of like, I'm gonna follow this tutorial, Strictly so that I can learn the workflow of like uh, right yeah of the effects like I, I really want to do the the blender tutorial you just finished the whole series for the anvil I think oh, right. yeah, like yeah. I feel like that's a good beginning to end process of of getting my hands wet with blender yeah I'm like okay yeah I might do that <laughs> we'll see <laughs> yeah. it's hard to like spare time for for learning new programs anymore mm. yeah so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, talking about the, the visual effects. Okay, so what, what's the workflow of Corridor Digital, like from an idea for a short film? Because that's what I've always been impressed with, is okay. the, like, the rapid production of these, these things. Um, so that's, that's the hardest part, is coming up with ideas for videos, because hmm. anyone can come up with an idea that has a ton of VFX in it. And yeah. it's like, that's not the hard part. The hard part is picking and choosing your fights meaning where do we put the VFX shots? Because right. every shot can't be a VFX shot, otherwise you're gonna spend two months working on this video. Mm -hmm. And even if it does get 10 million views, it's not gonna pay for two months worth of time for five people. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they're, 
paying minimum wage, that still adds up to thousands and thousands of dollars yeah. that a YouTube video, even with 10 million views, isn't really gonna make back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's all about trying to find your moments. Mm -hmm. Where is a big moment? So if you actually go look through most of the corridor videos, there's usually three big moments in each one. Um, most, most of the shots don't have any VFX, and then it'll kind of lead up to this big reveal where there's this big VFX shot, like this guy crumbling made out of stone, he crumbles to the ground, and it's like this big panning shot. And it's like, that's a shot that you can spend a couple of days working on because you only have maybe five or 10 shots in the entire video. Mm -hmm. So yeah. over time, you just start kind of learning what effects you can do quickly, what effects take more time, and you, and you learn to kind of design your short film around that, you know? You don't have a CG character in every single shot. If you do have a CG character, he's in maybe a couple of the shots, not often. Yeah, yeah. We don't always follow that very well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll do a video where every shot's a VFX shot. Like a, a couple years ago, I worked on a video called Mario Skate, where it's essentially me dressed up as Luigi riding a, an electric skateboard through the city of Los Angeles, just along streets and whatnot. We filmed it at 60 frames per second on a GoPro. Right. on one of those GoPro gimbals. It was actually brand new at the time. Not many people had these gimbals, and now they're everywhere. Right. Um, so yeah, it was a really cool concept, and I threw tons of VFX at that video. Um, and it was at 60 frames per second, which is two and a half times longer the typical length of a normal video. So even though the time is the same, the number of frames is 250% bigger. Right. And trying to motion track fish-eyed GoPro footage is, it was a challenge on top of putting just pretty much every single shot was a VFX shot. Jeez. I spent five straight weeks working on that video. And what? at the end of it, it was like, when it came time to like really like crunching, I, it was like a week and a half of working probably 14 hour days every single day. And then the final four or five days, it was just nothing all nighters every single day. I was sleeping in here. Oh my like, gosh. Really? Just, like here? Yeah. Like, I, in the room down below us, I would, I would literally just go in there, lay down on the couch, get an hour nap in, wake back up, whew, go grab a Red Bull, and then keep at it. Oh, that's brutal. This is like, I knew the number of shots I had left to do, and I knew the amount of time I had left to do them in, yeah. and it was just not a favorable condition. Oh, my goodness. But fortunately, I had an entire week off after that point, because I was going on vacation, which is why I was, like, cranking to do this. To, uh, that's why I was cranking right. to get it done, because I was going on vacation, and it had to go up while I was gone. Mm. Is there a strict like deadline process here? <sighs> yes and no. So because of the nature of YouTube, you're your own boss, you could upload whenever you want. Mm. And a lot of our viewers don't really realize that that's not really the case for us. Mm. Uh, because we have to be strict on ourselves, otherwise a video might take three weeks and then suddenly four weeks to finish. And then you start getting the habit of you know, spending three or four weeks or you're getting into the habit of delaying a video to take more time. Right, yeah. And the margins on YouTube videos are very small. So you have to be really strict with how much time and money you spend on each video. So the more time you spend on it is more money. Yeah. And so you have to be really strict. We cannot spend more than five days mm -hmm. doing all the VFX for this entire video. So you try to be as fast as you can, but you get to a point where it's like, all right, we start having, we, you have to start cutting corners. Mm -hmm. You have to start figuring, okay, what can we get by that the YouTube viewer isn't going to care about. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, you start lowering your standards, I guess. You know, yeah. this shot, eh, there's some things I'm not quite happy with it, but you got it 90% of the way there, and the final 10% takes just as much time as the other 90%, mm -hmm. just to really polish it, make it look good. And we try to do that as much as we can, but sometimes it's like, mm, ah, the viewer's not going to care that, that that feather isn't quite as nice on that dust right. element, you know? Yeah, Simple yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes we'll just straight up not do VFX shots. Like this shot, we intended to have this cool thing in the shot, but we don't have time to do that shot anymore, so it's just gonna be that. Oh, just right. Absent of the VFX shot, because yeah, yeah. it was gonna be a bonus to it. You know, it didn't, the shot was able to convey the information and, and push the story along without that, the VFX element. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's not necessary. It would have been nice to have it, but. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's how we do it. We, like, we try to focus on having like, two, three, maybe four different big VFX shots that we can put a lot of effort into, and then everything else is just, just edited footage put together. Uh, so that way we can turn it around really fast, because the more VFX shots you have, the longer it's gonna take. Yeah. For instance, recently we did a, a uh, Player Unknown Battlegrounds video, which is a popular yeah. video game right now. We did a whole short film based on that, and it had 40 VFX shots. Granted, most of them were things like muzzle flashes and bullet hits and stuff like that, but you know, 
at the end of the day, 40 shots is a, is, is a large number to do when it's just like you and a couple other people trying to get it done in a few days. Yeah, right. Um, especially at, at, at a, especially when trying to do it at a, a standard of quality that you know our audience has come to expect. Right. Yeah. So it's a trade-off. Yeah. So I want to talk about your your sort of um, something that I think is really important to your success is that yeah, like you, you mentioned sort of offhanded like. Yeah, I taught myself, you know, <laughs> After Effects, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. um, were there any uh, any factors that you think contribute? Because some people just don't, they don't do that, right? They feel like, for example, what's your opinion on college for art degrees? For art, I think it's good. Okay. You know, art is very subjective and it, it, it helps being taught subjective things, like what makes this painting a good painting. You know, what, what separates these splats of paint dots on a, on a page versus these splats of paint dots on a page? Why is this thing worth $200,000 and this thing gets thrown in the trash? It's all subjective opinion and, but at, there's also a, a good amount of objective quality to that, you know? And, and there's a lot of guidance. So if, if you're going to school for an art degree or for a film degree, that there's a lot of value there. But if you're going to school for like uh, learning how to do technical things like After Effects or a 3D program, college might not be the best place for that. There are technical schools that maybe are a good fit. Like I, a friend of mine named Connor, he went to school at, what's the name of the big uh, VFX school here in LA? Uh, I can't think of the name. But like, like any number of big VF, like Nomen, right. Nomen School of VFX. Yeah. You know, you, you, it, that is a very famous school for teaching people how to use programs, yeah. which is great. You know, I, I just, from my point of view, because that's my experience, I taught everything myself because you learn by experience. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary. It, it may be good. I'm not saying it's bad. If you want to do that and you want to get better by going to a school and learning from professionals and you know, cranking through it and going through the coursework, that's what you want to do. I think that's okay. I just don't think it's necessary. But then again, I'm also outside of the realm of the industry. You know, it's, it's very different. You know, with the industry, you've got to take those steps. You've got to get the degree before they even consider hiring you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you're doing freelance, let's say your goal is to just do freelance visual effects. You, you take on a project here and there and you work on it. The only thing they care about is your demo reel. They don't care about where you went to school. They don't care about how much you know. They just want to know about what you can do for them. And they can discern that by looking at your demo reel. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, he knows how to do smoke simulations, obviously. He knows how to composite fairly well. Sure, he'll be good enough for this job. Hire him. Yeah, right. Uh, oh, he's 16 and has been doing this since he was nine years old. Apparently we can't hire him because he's not old enough to be hired for this job. Like, Right, yeah. You know, stuff like that. I went to college, but I got a degree in engineering, which is pretty much the exact opposite of an art degree. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I'd be able to do what I do now without that degree. Really? Because it taught me how to work hard and it taught me how to learn. Hmm. Uh, That's which is, is weird. It's like, I mean, engineering in and of itself is a degree in problem solving yeah. and, and, and learning. It's like I literally got a degree in how to learn. Because there's all this stuff that I learned that I don't know anymore, but I learned it at some point. Mm. I used to know how to do vector calculus. I couldn't, for the life of me, do vector calculus now. Yeah. But at some point, I was able to. And the, the, the work required to learn that and actually like, get through the whole process of being able to do that and then turn around and do it for the next class and then do it for the next semester over and over again, yeah. it kind of instills in you this ability to kind of like push through um, you know, challenges and, and work around uh, problems and yeah. kind of really figure out and VFX is, is honestly a perfect application of that sort of thinking because VFX at its core is all about problem solving. You have this shot. Your problem is you need to put this, this car in the shot and you don't have a car to film. You have to be able to make it from scratch in CG. What are the steps involved? And you're just like, all right, step one, track the shot. Step two, get a, a model a car. Step three, track into the shot. Step four. Uh, render it out. You know, it's like there's all these steps and it's, yeah. So you can easily learn that on your own. But for me, I, I, I do not regret in the least getting an engineering degree, even though I don't use the diploma hmm. at all. That's really unique, yeah. I think. Yeah. But I mean, the same could be said for any degree. Like right. all it takes is just working hard. It could be a, a really hard job for all I care. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
being able to learn how to work hard and problem solve are really, really important mm. skills I think any person doing any work should yeah. have. Yeah. It's good that they taught that. And you could say a lot of people today, they say that that's the reason that college isn't good. Um, because of the fact that it doesn't teach you problem solving and grit and all that other stuff. I remember having a class where my, my professor kind of went up to the front of the class and was like, 80% of what you learn in college, you will forget the moment you leave. Because it's like, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I used to know Spanish, but I don't speak Spanish anymore, so I, I don't know it, in it at all anymore. Right, yeah. Sort of thing. I, didn't, I, I was never that good at Spanish. <laughs> I took high school Spanish, and I thought I was pretty good at it from that. Right, yeah. But I haven't... But I haven't spoken Spanish really at all since then, so I barely know it. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing for, you know, anything really. You stop using it, you, you, you lose it over time. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with pretty much every class I learned in college. I know like the overarching like concepts here and there. Mm -hmm. some th it's, it's surprising some of the things that do stick with you versus what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, what you end up taking away from something like that is, how did I get there? Yeah. What did I take away from that? It's the same thing with a tutorial. Mm -hmm. You watch a tutorial, about how to do, gosh, what, what's, a, what's an After Effects tutorial that I can use as an example? Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna say something simple, muzzle flashes. Okay. The simplest, most basic and common After Effects tutorial out there, how yeah. to do a muzzle flash. And you watch the tutorial, it's not about doing the muzzle flash, it's about all the steps to get you to that point. It's about the buttons you press, the tools you use. Yeah. That's what the tutorial is about. It's, this tutorial might be about muzzle flashes on, on the surface level, but really it's about using the pen tool to mask out solids to use as environmental glow on the objects around where the muzzle flash is gonna light up. You know, That's what the tutorial is about, is teaching you how to use the masking tool, how to use a certain effect, like the levels effect in After Effects. Um, that's what those tutorials are actually about, but everyone thinks that they're about making a muzzle flash or putting a hole in the wall or tracking a 3D camera Right. It's yeah. not about the end product, it's about the, the, the process. The steps to get you there. Yeah. yeah, and so whenever I watch the tutorial, I, I focus on, okay, what are the steps involved in doing this? Okay, you're using this, this type of effect, you're using this tool. Why? Why not use the other tool that's right next to it that looks to do a very similar thing? Mm -hmm. So in the tutorial, if you can explain, I'm using this one instead of this one because it allows me to do this, this really kind of esoteric thing among this model, for instance, if you're modeling something, uh, that's why I choose this one. You're like, oh, great, now I know. I don't care about what you're making, but I know that you just did that, so I'm gonna, that's gonna stick with me. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, jumping a little bit, what do you think is, um, because you've got so much experience making the effects and, and um, putting together these rapid short films, what do you think are some things that, that make a because you, you, you can watch some, some films and you can tell it's low budget. What are some of the telltale signs that you think are low budget? Bad sound first off. Okay. Yes. Our, vi our videos are you know, very, very visual. Uh, our visuals are very important to us. Mm -hmm. But if we have bad audio, it doesn't matter how good your visuals are. Because mm -hmm. they're going to hear just crappy audio, like, whether it's like just really tinny or there's no bass or it's echoey or any number of reasons that can make your audio bad, yeah. that is just a glaring fault. Like, audio is literally half of the video. Hmm. Right. And, yeah. And, that's and you can kind of get by with bad video as long as you have good audio. If you have great audio, you can have a crappy video, right. image quality-wise. Yeah, yeah. So that's the first thing that I, I like to say is like, all right, to that sort of qu question is like, you know, what are the telltale signs of, you know, a, an amateur video, yeah. right? Bad audio. Bad audio. If and is that fixable audio, with, with microphones? Like proper, is that why, they, why it's bad? Yeah, if, if you're shooting a short film on a DSLR and you don't have a microphone plugged into your DSLR, you're just getting onboard audio, what are you doing? It's, I mean, it works, it can work, but you need to have good audio. Yeah. Beyond that, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, get good cameras, get good lenses. I'm gonna spend all my money on the next camera. But the problem is that that camera's gonna be out of date in less than a year literally less than a year, I mean about a year, but less than. Yeah. That camera is gonna be no longer the best camera out there, and then give it another three years, and it's not even acceptable anymore. Hmm. You know, it's one of those things. I remember, so, when I was part of the YouTube Next Up program, they gave me a couple thousand dollars 
to you know, help my channel. And I was like, I'm gonna buy an FS100, a Sony FS100, which was a really good camera. And it was like a $3,000 camera. And I was gonna have to put up some of my own money to like buy this thing. And I was like, I need a good camera to make good quality videos. And then after working here for a while, I realized I can rent a camera if I really need it. And I don't have to have a good camera. So I ended up investing that money into building a computer instead. Because that's where you spend most of your time as a VFX artist is at the computer. Yeah. Right. So I just invested in making sure my computer was fast enough to keep up with me, and I was good. So from a visual standpoint, people say, oh, a better camera will mean a better video. Yeah. Which, to a certain degree, is not wrong. Mm -hmm. I just think it's kind of misdirected. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I think what is more important than having a good quality sensor or good glass is having good lighting. Right. These lights. Mm -hmm. You guys, good job on the lighting here. Like, you can, you can shoot this on a pretty crappy camera and it'll still look pretty solid because the lights are set up properly. Right. Which is something that you really only learn from film school, by the way. Uh, right. I mean, you can learn it from experience w working on set. Like, I don't know much about lighting at all. Right. Uh, other than what I've learned working with guys who do. Yeah, yeah. Which is a, a good place to learn. Yeah. But yeah, so that, one, that was one of the first things I invested in was just a lighting kit. You know, just like three soft boxes that you can put at various parts of your uh, set to light up the scene properly. And that goes so far in making your image look better that when I see people just shooting with na natural lighting inside, I'm just like, yeah. it's like, okay, I will, I will uh, watch this video and kind of get through it, but you immediately have decreased expectations, Right. Yeah. you know? Uh, so yeah, bad sound, uh, bad lighting, and bad visual effects, I think, kind of goes without saying. If you have bad visual effects, that will bring down the video as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless that's part of the video. Like, mm -hmm. if the video, like, part of the, the style of that, if that video is to have bad VFX, there's lots of great videos out there mm -hmm. that they're purposely just having, like, really, like, sharp keyframes on stuff just because <laughs> that, that's part of the character of the video. Right. Um, like that glitch one you guys did, right? The <laughs> yeah. video game character glitch. Yeah, yeah, the glitch. Man, yeah, yeah. that was funny. Although, that was a little different because we, we actually still tried hard to make even the glitchiness look good. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's kind of the, I don't know. Huh. I think I think it's also easy to to uh, um, point to the cameras because it's so easily identifiable with a dollar sign. It's like well, dollars more dollars equals better. Whereas what's hard to answer is what you're talking about. Like what is good lighting? It's like you can't just say buy that specific brand of light because yeah. it's not all about that. It's where you position it, and that like it took AJ twenty minutes to set all this up. That was a lot of fiddling and this, 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 Correct. and that. And that you can't really you know, convey to someone very quickly. Like, oh, if you want to make your film better, you've got to read this book, you've got to do this, 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 you know. And people who are serious about learning that, they, they get it, you know? They, I mean, it takes them some time before they finally do get it, but there, there comes a point where they, they finally understand. Like, oh, if I want to make my shots look better, I have to light it properly. Yeah. It's not just about lighting me, it's also about lighting the background the right way, yeah. uh, shaping the light, making sure the angle of the light is right. That's stuff that they eventually learn that they need to learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, by watching you know, some of our videos or some of like other film, like film riot videos, uh, educational based videos for filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. You can learn a lot of stuff from there. Uh, and then, so once you know, okay, I need to work on that, then you can take that knowledge and apply that to your own research. Mm -hmm like researching what makes a good studio light. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to put the lights at a certain angle behind me to get the right sort of edge light across my head? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. You can be told that, but I think you really need to learn why mm -hmm. yeah. before it really clicks why you gotta do that. Yeah, that's good to know. I'm, I, know <laughs> I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I wanted to ask your opinions of what, what was, of all the shorts you guys have done, what was one of the most uh, difficult, or the most painful experiences? Oh god, uh, which ones weren't? Um, <laughs> I did a video last year called Real Mario Galaxy. Okay. And that was a, are you familiar with the little planet effect? Mm -hmm. With You basically take a 360 image and depending on how you warp it, you position the sky to be on the outside and the ground to be in the middle. And it creates this illusion that makes the ground look like a planet. Yeah. 
And I, I was like, that's a really cool effect because I'd just gotten a new 360 camera and I was like, this was a really cool thing to do. So I want to make this whole video about it. And uh, we, we, we eventually settled on doing it in the Mario universe because it was an existing IP. Those get better views than original IPs. Mm -hmm. And Mario Galaxy, which is about a game of like running across different planets, mm -hmm. seemed like the perfect fit. So I did that. And it turned out to be way harder than I, I anticipated. First off, just trying to coordinate mentally the various things. Like there's one shot in that video where there's two different planets that collide and people jump back and forth between those planets. Mm -hmm. And you have to like act between the two people on each of those planets. But in reality, those are completely different locations. Right. So you have to like get the timing down to be like, okay, I'm going to walk this way for 10 seconds, stop, look up like this, even though the ground is that way, like do this. And then jump. And then hopefully when you get to the next set, you can do it well enough that it matches up. And that was a right. big challenge. We had to reshoot a couple times and it took me like probably like three days just to like choreograph everything to get it just right to be able to shoot. I have a, I have a habit of going a little bit too ambitious on projects sometimes <laughs> and, and like biting off too much to chew. Yeah. Uh, that Mario Skate video I mentioned was a challenge because that was just a, a tremendous amount of work. Mm. I'd say those videos were probably the two most challenging videos for me. Mm -hmm. There are other videos that were pretty difficult, but not super difficult. Other videos that are hard, but I'm still able to go home in a normal time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not having to work overtime, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but as far as like videos that required overtime, those are a few. There's a video I did earlier this year called Gizmoduck. Oh, yeah. um, that was a lot of fun to do, but I made the mistake of having the main character have half his body be CG. So every time he's on screen, I have to replace that, which just added up the number of shots. And they weren't just easy shots. They were like tracking, animating, 3D rendering, all that stuff. And yeah. so I was like, oh God. On top of all the other effects that were in that video. So that was, that was a hard video to do. I had to pull a few all-nighters for that one. And then there are some videos that are challenging to do because they're hard to kind of like wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. I directed a video a few years ago called Portal Trick Shots. Oh yeah, so, that's one of my favorites. Oh, awesome, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm really, really proud of that video, but it was a really challenging video to pull off because it's like, okay, we're gonna put a portal there and a portal up on the, on the ceiling, right? But here's the thing, you can't just put a camera, you gotta really account for what it's like for light to travel through that portal at the same angle as coming out of that one. And so then you have to put a camera basically up there looking in that direction, flip it upside down and put it underneath that portal down there. Mm. You had, yeah, you basically had to account for what is the view from this far away from this portal, basically meaning this far away inside of that wall up there. You had to basically like move your head and position it inside the wall that, dis that same distance away that you are from this portal and do that for every single portal. <laughs> um, and, so, and then also trying to come up with, you know, uh, tricks, you know, trick shots that were at least interesting, but also leveled up as they yeah. went. So like we started simple and then by the last one, it's like right. Yeah. So that was, that was a challenging one to really kind of film. We didn't really know what we we're doing with that video changed dramatically in editing. Mm -hmm. We had this whole scene set up in here that we filmed in here that ended up just kind of being like this montage thing in editing. Uh, and it really played to the video, I think in the end, uh, it helped that there was a good soundtrack that we can just edit to. Right, yeah. Yeah, a lot of our videos change uh, quite a lot from just from the point of shooting to the point of editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, yeah, it's like, this is what we're going to make. And then it's like, this is what we filmed. And then it's, this is what we've edited. And they're very, they're very distinct things. Yeah, right. and, and they have, uh, there's a name for that in the, in the film industry, the, the third stage of writing. Right. Is editing, I think, yeah, is yeah. how that's called. It's like there's the first stage, the writing. The second stage, the actual filming. And then the third stage is editing. Yeah, right. Everything can change very much in editing. Is, is, does story take a long time to build a story? It can. Uh, I'm not particularly great at writing stories. I'm not really a writer. Uh, the stories that I, I tend to direct and write are, are way more simple, sort of like, I'll tell a story, but it'll be a very simple story and to the point. And it's usually a little bit more visual based rather than dialogue based yeah, or yeah. driven rather. Right. And it, it depends on the video. If it's just like kind of just a simple video, it depends on the point of what we're trying to do. Is this more of like a visual gag that we're just trying to throw on YouTube and hopefully it'll get a lot of views or are we trying to tell a real story with like real meaningful beats? Mm -hmm. Those like the more meaning we put to a story, the more time we'll work on it. Mm -hmm. um, the more dialogue in a piece, the more time we'll like try to make sure the dialogue is good. 
And other times we'll just straight up improvise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So. Um, and when you watch uh, a short film, because I, I always like, like when I'm watching Hollywood films, whatever like that, it always blows my mind because I don't understand visual effects enough to know how some of these effects are done. But I know somebody like you would probably watch a lot of films and know exactly how they did that, 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 and that. Is there anything that you've ever been stumped by that you don't know what they did? So recently there was a movie called John Wick 2. Mm -hmm. Semi-recently. Earlier this year there was a movie called John Wick 2 and in it there was a fight scene that took place in a hall of mirrors. Mm -hmm. So it was like they're literally just fighting back and forth, like shooting guns and stuff with mirrors all over the place. And they had to paint out all of the camera crew, the cameras themselves, all that stuff were painted out, and I don't really know how they did it, mm. to be completely honest. Right. Um, probably a lot of just like putting up one-way mirrors and shooting through that, so they're not even in the shot to begin with. But right. yeah. I don't. Know. Um, I don't know. A lot of the stuff. I mean, pretty much any time ILM works on something, I'm just like, yeah. I don't know how they did that. Yeah. Because it's like that's what happens when you throw millions of dollars and hundreds of people at a problem, <laughs> and it's like it gets amazing. Yeah. Uh, but then you have other companies like you know Frame Store and. Gosh, um, MCP, MPC, MPC. Right. Um, you know, which are much smaller, but are still able to do you know similar levels of quality. You know, uh, Weta Workshop, Weta Digital in New Zealand. They're putting out freaking uh, gorillas that look so lifelike you cannot tell the difference. And there's a lot of intricacies that I, I have no idea how they do that with. Yeah. But the overall architecture of you know shoot a person, uh, get facial capture, um, facial animation. Uh, performance capture, rather, and going through the, the, the broad steps of, okay, take a shot, animate a shot uh, digitally, uh, render that out, and then composite it with various passes. I've, I've, I've gotten a lot better at understanding the broad spectrum of how to do that sort of thing. But as far as like the specifics of how they do a lot of that stuff, like I remember Pacific Rim, <clears throat> the movie Pacific Rim, which came out a few years ago, was a great example of, they, I think they just started using the Arnold renderer, mm -hmm. or it was one of the first few movies that they had used with that. Yeah. And it, it was great because they were able to do all kinds of rendering with it. And they were doing like water simulations, smoke simulations, rigid body simulations, all that's rendered. Uh, and it just blows my mind that they can do that, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, in theory, I know that you have to simulate this ocean and you simulate this giant robot leg swishing through it, which will cause waves. And then you have to add the foam and all that stuff to it. Yeah. I couldn't even begin to tell you how, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, because they're using proprietary software. I could, I could tell you how I would start trying to do it with the plugins I already know how, but I can tell you right up front that it's not going to be able to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's like any any more, a movie will come out and it has flawless visual effects. Like a few years ago, I'd be like, oh, I can tell that that's a visual effect. But any more, it's like it is straight up photo real. You cannot tell the difference mm -hmm. between real life and fake. Hmm. We're, we're right at the cusp of that being a normal thing. Did you watch, have you seen The Revenant? I did see The Revenant, yeah. yeah. That bear scene had me <clears throat> that was for so, ages. Oh Wasn't God. that intense? That was really intense, and, and it was all one shot. Yeah. That's <laughs> and funny. they managed to, I mean, they filmed it in a few different shots, but they were able to blend it together really, really smartly. Yeah, and I, I was amazed at how, um, like, it, it was all that, like, because, of course, if you've got a CG character in the live action, they're fine separate, but the moment they interact, it's like, oh, well, how are we gonna make that look real? But he's, he was getting like pushed around and shoved. And I was like, how is this that happening? That is actually a good example of an effect. I don't quite know how they did that because mm. they obviously had to have some sort of rig mm. interacting with Leo DiCaprio, like pulling him, picking him up, throwing him back down and flipping right. him over, stuff like yeah. that. I think and I guess they like must've just like, yeah, a combination of that. Maybe there's like an actual rig there or, and they just had to paint it out. It's like, there's a lot of steps involved and I don't exactly know how they did it. I can speculate how they did it. But. Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that movie, man. <laughs> yeah. Visual effects look so much more real when you are able to combine it with, with real life elements, you know? Like yeah. being able to do a real explosion and then comp in fake explosions around it, they suddenly look way more real because the real explosion is carrying so much weight. Right, yeah. You know, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Anytime you can combine visual effects on top of a real plate of actual special effects, mm -hmm. they will always look way better than yeah. they would single-handedly just visual effects or just special effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely.
Well, it's been good talking with you. Dude, Andrew, thanks for coming by. Yeah. This has been great. Yeah. It's good to finally meet you in person. I've watched a lot of your videos, so it's cool to actually talk with you, like, in the flesh. Oh, nice. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the interview. I look forward to seeing this online. Yeah.